Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un each recently had high-profile meetings with President Donald Trump. And while those meetings had many people talking about a range of different things, they had one thing in common. They needed professional interpreters to communicate and understand each other. But what goes into this line of work? Well, that's what I asked the Director of Interpreter Training at the University of Massachusetts Amherst when we spoke in the studio. There are two things that are important. One is in the area of knowledge. Obviously, um, a person to be a good interpreter and translator needs to have a high proficiency in at least two languages. Um, and then there are skills that need to be developed over time. Uh, and those skills can be developed in training courses or, or um, you know, they, they can be self-taught as well. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so there are these two areas of um, first, the knowledge that you need to have, and then the skills that need to be developed. But then when you take it sort of at the large level, the national stage, we just saw most recently the summit that was held between President Trump and North Korea's Kim Jong-un, and that was a huge platform. They're talking about a very difficult discussion, nuclear weapons. Yeah. What does it take to interpret at that level? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is the, an area within interpreting studies that we call conference interpreting. Usually people working in conference interpreting uh, have gone to uh, university uh, for training, and usually it's a bachelor's degree, um, uh, and then sometimes further a master's degree as well. And the mode of interpretation used uh, most often uh, is simultaneous, the one that you speak almost at the same time uh, with the speakers. Uh, and it takes a lot of training, a lot of knowledge, a lot of preparation. Because you're, um, you're holding the information that you've just heard in your head and then yeah. regurgitating it in another language. Yeah. That's, that sounds incredibly, incredibly challenging and difficult. Yep. In, in a setting that there is a dialogue, like two heads of states, and, and sometimes they bring each, each one brings their own interpreter, which is what happened in, in this case that you're uh, referencing. And this has to do with an element of trust. Each head of state brings his own. They usually decline uh, using uh, the other countries. Something to almost uh, secure to, to inform the impartiality of that person, or the excuse me, the the loyalty that they would have to that particular side. I yeah, would it's this element of trust. I, I trust this person to uh, be my voice in this other language. Mm -hmm. um, so, in dialogue settings, um, you talked about memory. Uh, there are ex this is called consecutive interpretation, where a person says a few things, and then stops, and then somebody, uh, and then the interpreter relays that in another language. Uh, memory plays a huge uh, role, short-term and mid-term memory. But also another skill that interpreters develop and learn in courses is note-taking. Note-taking for consecutive interpretation. So they, you will often see these interpreters carry notepads. Mm -hmm. Uh, where they take down um, a lot of information. And it's very specific. It's very different uh, from note-taking for college or shorthand writing. It's something only interpreters um, use. And um, after a day or so, if, if they go back to that note, to those notes, they won't be able to remember or recall because those notes are very attached to that moment and that memory. Hmm. You know? What about history? Not only the history of the individual country, but also the history of the, the sort of the topic at hand, and then also nuclear weapons. It would, I imagine science would even come into play. How yeah. do you prepare, or how do you even, um, you know, do you become, when you go through interpreting school, do you say, okay, I want to specialize in scientific and uh, nuclear weapons arenas? I mean, is it that very specific? Uh, one of the skills that is taught to interpreters and um, students is is um, topic preparation, how to prepare and how to do research for a certain topic. So in situations like that, uh, interpreters are given at ahead of time uh, the information about what the summit is about and what are some of the topics that may come up, so they prepare for it. And preparation includes uh, researching terminology that might come up in that uh, setting, um, and then sometimes it involves translating, uh, written, doing tr written translation of materials uh, and practicing. Uh, but the, the bottom line is um, no one is a walking dictionary. <laughs> uh, so interpreters also learn the skills of how to deal when they encounter uh, a challenge that they 
not automatically can come up with a translation for. I imagine that would come up also with sort of language nuance or turns of phrase that yeah. might not easily translate from one language to another. Yeah, and there are several strategies that uh, we learn and we teach students how to deal with that. Uh, one of them is to obviously try to study as much as possible about idiomatic um, expressions and idioms from different languages. Uh, but also how to reformulate those if you cannot come up with the you know, right equivalent there for There are times that. where a literal translation probably wouldn't make sense no, to the they person. Need to, it needs to be reformulated. Another strategy is, is explaining what that means. Um, uh, another strategy, if you are in a conference and you are in a booth and using um, uh, equipment and, and that comes up, uh, interpreters can even um, tell the audience, hey, this person just cracked a joke. I cannot translate it or interpret it in another language. Uh, and then you will see the audience laugh. And then the speaker has the um, notion that they understood his joke, but actually they didn't. They heard the interpreter say, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, Not going to work this, out. <laughs> this joke doesn't have a translation. Yeah. So that's a strategy as well. So taking it off of the national and international stage into the more local level, you know, how is interpretation, how are interpretation skills used maybe at the more local level? Okay, so, so then we move from conference interpreting to another area that we call community interpreting. In Europe and in, in Australia, this is called public service interpreting, which is interpretation that happens um, to uh, provide access to immigrant populations to services that they are entitled to. So you will see that in healthcare interpreting. Um, there's a big hospital here, Bay State, that has a very large... Um, yeah, sometimes when you get to the doctor's window, it'll say these languages can be translated for you, right? Yep, yep. So they, uh, hospitals like Bay State, they have staff interpreters depending on the language demand. So the biggest demand in Springfield is obviously Spanish. So they have staff interpreters who work there uh, full time. Uh, but for other languages, they hire um, uh, you know, freelance interpreters from, uh, from different agencies. So not only hospitals, but the courts and uh, lawyers' offices, um, social security office, um, uh, workers' compensation meetings, and, and you name it. Every, everywhere, oh, oh, schools is a big uh, uh, interpreting area as well, inter interpretation done in schools for immigrant children. Um, so at the community level, this, uh, uh, the type of interpretation that goes on is, is more commonly um, the consecutive one, which is dialogue. Uh, so there are always at least three people in the encounter. There's uh, the provider of the service, and then there's the patient or the client, and then the interpreter. And we call this the triadic encounter. Uh, so this is often a dialogue, and, and consecutive interpretation is done at that level. So for you, I also know that you, you're a professional interpreter, but you teach interpretation as well to others. Yep. Uh, is there something that you learned in that process that sort of has changed the way that you approach your profession? In my own experience? Yeah, uh, yeah. as you're teaching someone, has anything ever popped up for you that said, oh yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to alter how I do this for myself now? Yes, 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 often. And it, it's, a, it's a constant um, cycle because in addition to teaching, I... I I still make a point of, uh, of doing uh, interpretation, uh, uh, not as often as I used to, but I, at least once a month. Uh, so I can bring that experience to students and, and share with them my experience and how I was able to solve a certain challenge that came up and what kind of strategy I use and what kind of theoretical framework helped me solve a certain challenge. Uh, interpreting is very complex. Uh, in addition to whatever happens in the brain, which is very complicated, um, uh, there are also issues of ethics and decision making. Um, so interpretation is very immediate. You need to make decisions very fast because it's oral language. Yeah. Uh, translation, for example, you have some time to consult dictionaries, to look Work up that words. Written word. Yeah. So interpreting, you don't have that luxury. So you need to make decisions very fast. So I always emphasize that critical thinking is a huge uh, piece of the learning um, curve for students as well because they make to make uh, they need to make decisions that sometimes are really. Uh, really complicated and they need to have the critical thinking skills to be able to do that.